Bibles to the book of 2 Timothy tonight, 2 Timothy chapter 4, please. I'd like to read for you the first five verses of that chapter. You can follow with me if you would. 2 Timothy chapter 4, we'll read verses 1 through 5. The Bible says, I charged thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Let's bow, please, for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight as we come together. We pray for the Ferrari family. and they're, I pray you'd bless them, my Father. I know that their hearts are heavy and they've been troubled. And they've experienced something few people experience. I pray you'd be with them, help them to heal in their hearts and their minds. And fill them with your spirit and give them the joy of the Lord and the fruit of the spirit. And I pray for their belongings that folks would rise up and give to them to help them. Lord, other churches would feel led by the Holy Spirit to send money to help. And I pray, my Father, for this night as we look into the Word of God, thank you for those who come out on a Wednesday night. Thank you for those who are watching and those who are listening that, that think it important enough to take the time to hear the Word of God and to be instructed out of your Word. I pray you'd guide and direct and open the lips of your servant to speak in the heart of every person to receive your Word. Glorify yourself, magnify your son, edify your people, my Lord, and save the lost. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. According to chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, the Apostle Paul is nearing the end of his ministry. He's writing to his young understudy, Timothy, and preparing Timothy for the days ahead. Now, like us, Paul did not know when the Lord Jesus would return. He just knew that he would. And in our text verses, the apostle charges Timothy to preach the word. Now, Paul wanted Timothy to preach his heart out. And he tells Timothy that there will be times when his preaching would be well received and there would be times when his preaching would not be received but resisted. And whether it was in season or out of season, Timothy was to remain faithful to preach the word. Paul also spoke of a time to come. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, he talks about perilous times shall come. He says in 2 Timothy 4, 3, for the time will come. Paul did not know when this time would come, but he knew that such times were coming. We could go over the descriptions of the times to come and what people will be like that's listed in chapters 3 and 4, but that's not our goal tonight. Our goal is to figure out what a Christian is to do when those times do come. What times? The perilous times. What times? When they will not endure sound doctrine. When people do not want to hear the word of God. Personally, I think the times that Paul is referring to have appeared in many versions at different times throughout history. But I also believe that the times to which Paul refers have come. I believe when Paul talks about perilous times, the Holy Spirit of God was looking down to the present age. I believe when the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to say the time will come, That the Holy Spirit was looking down through time and saw the present age. There are reasons after reasons to believe so. But if you notice the characteristics mentioned of the last days and the perilous times, you have to notice that the characteristics mentioned in chapter 3 and 4 have to do with the hearts and minds and character of mankind in general. 
These characteristics and actions were always present in small pockets here and there. However, they have now burst onto the scene and have taken an almost universal position around the world. We used to talk about other countries and say that this is happening over there and that's happening over there, but now it's happening here. And so there is a, a spirit that's permeating the entire globe that can be characterized by the things mentioned in chapter 3 and 4 of 2 Timothy. In verse 5 of 2 Timothy chapter 4, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy that while all of this is going on around him, he was to watch, endure, work, and make full proof of his ministry. That phrase, make full proof, means to carry out fully. It means to carry out completely. It means to carry out entirely. In other words, Paul's saying this to Timothy, don't allow the spirit of the age and the opposition of the enemy and the coldness of the times to keep you from doing what God has called you to do. That sounds like a good admonition for today, doesn't it? We're to carry on in spite of the times. We're to carry on regardless of what others are doing. So how can we? I believe we're living in the very times that God is warning about through the writing of Paul. And how can we continue and to make full proof of our individual ministries and make full proof of our corporate ministry in such times and in the face of such times? I believe that among other things, there are a few key things that we need to do. Now, I'm going to share those with you tonight. Sometimes I wonder why there's not more victory in the Christian life for so many Christians. Why is it that it seems like we're falling by the wayside? Why is it does it seem like we're being swallowed up and gobbled up by that lion that, that roars and walks about? Why is it? Well, I think we could see three things that we need to do, and if we don't do them, we may be the casualty. Number one is in James chapter 4, verse 7. I want you to look with me in James chapter 4, verse 7. We're going to find our first two here. And the first one is, what, we, what do we need to do if we're going to have victory, if we're going to really be able to make full proof? of ourselves and of our ministry? Number one, we need to submit. Look what it says in verse 7. James chapter 4. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Isn't that interesting? He, James is called the book of practical Christianity. You want to learn how to have practical Christianity? Read the book of James. Memorize the book of James. Allow God to implement the book of James in your life. And he says here that we're, this word submit means to voluntarily put ourselves under the authority of God and obedience to God. Submitting ourselves, just as Jesus did when he said to the Father, he said, not my will, but thy will be done. And not just saying it, not just agreeing with that, well, yeah, that's true, but actually doing it ourselves. The seeming independent spirit that has swept through much of Christianity is dangerous. And I believe as a result of the spirit of the age in general. The spirit of the age is a proud, rebellious, and a self-centered spirit. It may be that many modern Christians are trying to roll up their sleeves and perform as Christians without submitting themselves to God first. We have all allowed the me, my, and mine mentality of the world to creep into our own hearts. What's the world live? Me, my, mine. Right? And living in this age, we may have allowed a little bit of that to creep into our own hearts and minds. 
We think like Americans more than like Christians. And don't get me wrong, I'm, a, I'm glad I'm an American. And I'm glad I think like an American instead of how some countries think. I mean, I look at them and say, whoa. But if you were here Sunday morning, you heard we're a culture, a subculture within a culture, a nation within a nation, a generation within a generation. And we're supposed to think with a renewed mind. And we're supposed to think Christian first, American second. I'm a Christian first. I'm an American second. I can be a Christian anywhere in the world. I can be a Christian whether I was born anywhere in the world, but I can't be an American anywhere I'm born in the world. My Christianity is eternal. My American uh, citizenship is temporal. We need to th think like the sons of God instead of like the sons of men. Sometimes we're filled with our own strength and our own ingenuity and our own philosophy of life and we haven't submitted those to God. You understand? He says submit yourselves to God. That means we submit our philosophy of life to God. That means we submit our, our, our future to God. That means we submit our ideas to God, our desires to God, our plans to God. We submit ourselves to God. And we say, Lord, if what I want to do isn't compatible with what you want, help me with that. Change me. But we go to God a lot of times and we say, God, this is what I'm doing. Rubber stamp it for me, would you please? As Christians, we are to be of a different mind. And here James uses the words like phrases like, submit yourselves therefore to God. Draw nigh unto God. Humble yourselves in the sight of God. That's how you get victory in life. That's how you get victory as a Christian. You submit yourself to God. You draw nigh unto God. You humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Remember Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. You remember that? Well, fruit is the product of, if, if fruit is product of the branch, it's wood, hay, and stubble. But if the fruit is the product of the vine, it's gold, silver, and precious stones. If my fruit is, is my, of my making, no matter how talented I am, no matter how intellectual I am, no, no matter how spiritual I think I am, if my fruit is the fruit of this branch, it's wood, hay, and stubble. But if the fruit is the fruit of the vine, in other words, the nourishment of Christ and his mind and his heart and his spirit working through me to produce the fruit he wants, now it's gold, silver, and precious stones. See the difference? If it's the fruit I want, wood, hay, and stubble. If it's the fruit he wants to produce, gold, silver, and precious stones. Now, the whole point is to get ourselves to the point where what we want and what Jesus wants are the same. That's when you're really abiding in the vine, isn't it? See? The Apostle Paul understood this. He wrote 1 Corinthians 15, 10, and he said this, But by the grace of God I am what I am. And, this, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. And look what he says. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Sounds like he's boasting, doesn't it? But then he says this real quick. Yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. He attributed the fact that his laboring more abundantly than they all was not the product of his own energy, his own constitution, his own industriousness, but was a direct result of God's grace. Paul's saying, I wouldn't be doing it if it wasn't for the grace. I couldn't do it without the grace of God. Paul's saying, when I look back at all that I've done and how the Lord has used me, I marvel. Because I know it wasn't me. But it was the grace of God working in me. See? Paul, the first thing out of his mouth when he met Jesus was this. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And that was his life, all his life, wasn't it? 
No, when we, get, when we go to bed at night, we ought, to, we ought to have a little talk with Jesus. And we ought, to, we ought to talk, Lord, say, now, Jesus, this is what I plan on doing tomorrow. I mean, we all make plans, and we should. We can't just, you know, fly by the seat of our pants all the time. And so we say to the Lord, I'm going to get up tomorrow morning, I'm going to go to work, I'm going to do this, I'm going to go here, I'm going to do that. But Lord, I'm your servant. These are my plans. And I give my plans to you, you can change them any way you want. See, that's submitting yourself to God. Oh, we don't want to do that though. I mean, hey, what if he, what if he decides to change our plans? I mean, what if he really does change our plans? Praise the Lord. You think he knows more than you? You think he's a little uh, a more under, understanding about the world and what's going on around us than you are? I think he is. Paul could never have done what he did by his own strength and ability. He is an example of what the Lord Jesus said in Luke chapter 18, verse 27. And he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. And so everything that I am, everything that I have done, everything that I've accomplished was impossible for me. The only reason it happened is because God made it possible. It was impossible for that unsaved person that I was. It was impossible to take that sow's ear and turn it into a silk purse. To take, to take that thorn and turn it into a rose. Well, I'm speaking, you know, hypothetically here. I'm still pretty thorny, but, you know. But you understand, that's the, that, what you can't do and what you can never be is possible with God. That which is impossible for you is possible for God. That which is impossible for, for you to be or what's impossible for you to do is possible if God's allowed her to be the one doing it. If we'll submit ourselves to God, who knows what he's going to do? If we, we, if we submit ourselves to God, who knows what he's going to make out of us? Who knows what doors he's going to open? Who knows what kind of things he's going to do in our lives and through our lives and with our lives? Who knows? Anything's po everything's possible with God. You know, we tell our kids, you know what the philosophy of the world is? The philosophy of the world is telling the kids they can do anything. That's a lie. You can be anything you want to be. No. What if the kid doesn't have the intelligence to be what he wants to be? What if he doesn't have the aptitude to be what he wants? What if he doesn't have the ability physically or mentally or emotionally to be what he wants to be? Uh -uh. But with God, all things are possible. God can make a stammering man lead millions of people to freedom. You see? If a Christian's going to make it in the 21st century, if he or she is going to fight the good fight and finish the course while keeping the faith, it's going to require submission to God. Here am I. I am yours. I am your servant. I am your son. I am your uh, steward. I am your sheep. Lord, you own me lock, stock, and barrel. You, I'm yours. My time's yours. My possessions are yours. My heart's yours. My plans are yours. The reason we're not seeing more victory in the Christian life is because people are trying to live the Christian life all by themselves. They haven't submitted themselves to God. All right, let's go on to number two. James chapter four, verse seven. What do you think the second word is? Resist. Look what he says. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil. And he'll flee from you. Notice the power of resistance is the result of submission. The reason many Christians cannot be victorious over sin is because they have not first truly submitted themselves to God. And, and it's not just a one-time thing. You don't come forward at a service and dedicate your life to God, and that's it, you're good. No, it's a daily thing. It's a throughout-the-day thing. You understand? Submitting ourselves to God. Because what we like to do as human beings, 
sinners saved by grace, is we like to hand, the, you know, we'll use an old-timey illustration because it's a little easier to do. You you, we take the reins and we hand them to Jesus and we're okay for a while and then we reach over and grab them again. And we, oh, what am I doing with these? Give them back. You see? Then we're okay for a while and we grab them again. We got to say, whoa, what am I doing with these? We got to keep giving the reins back to the Lord. We are to resist. Isn't that what it says? We need to resist the temptations that come to us regularly. Christians are not, are not untempted. You understand that? Faithful people are not untempted people. We all face temptations every day. The temptation to be lazy. The temptation to compromise. The temptation to quit. The temptation to act and react in the flesh. The temptation to disobey God. We could do one temptation after another, right? It comes, that thought, that attitude, that idea, it comes and tempts us and says, why don't you just, why don't you just, why don't you just? And we can't resist that temptation because it appeals to our flesh and to our old nature unless we've submitted ourselves to God. See? Once we put ourselves under his wing, now who's, who's in charge of protecting us? He is. See? But if we don't submit ourselves to God, who's in charge of protecting us? Us. We are... And we're not equipped for that. We're not, we're not capable of that. Do you understand? Let me ask you. Who is it that tempts you to lie? Tempts you to say yes to sin? Tempts you to lose your temper? Who is it that tempts you to quit? Who is it that tempts you to give up the fight? To not finish the course? Or to lose the faith? Who is it that tempts you to think more highly of yourself than you ought? Let me give you a hint. It's not God. The Bible says God tempts no man with evil. It's not God that brings those temptations. It's the devil. And we're told to resist him. But we're having an awful hard time resisting him and his temptations. Why? Because we're not submitted to God. We're told to resist. You know what? We are supposed to resist the constant pressures that are all around us to conform. And I want to say this, my friends, as we get deeper and deeper in the 21st century, the pressure to conform is going to get heavier and stronger as we go. As we march deeper into the end times, into the last days, it's like diving into deeper water. The pressure is going to get more and more and more and more and more. To what? To conform. Ostracize to conform. Intimidate to conform. Put in jail to conform. Who knows? What methodology the devil would use to try to get us to conform. We think, we think because, now I'm just, we think because we're in America, we're safe and sound. We think because we're in America, it's never going to happen to us. Yeah, that's, that's a good lullaby. America is a wonderful country. It's the best one on planet Earth. But it's still run by human beings. And it's still governed by sinners. And selfish people. And greedy people. Who are not above temptation. We are to resist the constant pressures that are all around us to conform. Romans 12, 2 says, and be not conformed to this world. But be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Listen, you cannot even prove or understand or know what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God unless you are, have a transformed thinking process. If you allow the world to conform you into its thinking, you'll never really be able to know the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You won't be able to discern it. 
Why? Because you're thinking like an American instead of like a Christian. You're thinking like the world instead of like the Lord. You got it? Let me ask you this. Who is it that pressures you to conform to the world's standards? To conform to the world's language, the world's philosophy, the world's entertainment, the world's ethics, the world's attitudes? I'll give you a hint. It's not God. So who would it be? The devil. And we're told to resist him. But so many Christians today, and I, I'm, I mean fundamental Bible-believing, gospel-preaching, Baptist Christians, are ignorantly being tempted and pressured and are like being led like lambs to the slaughter. I'm amazed at how lethargic and worldly and deceived so many Christians are today with little power to resist the pied piper of sin. Why? Why is that so? Because they're, truly, they're not truly submitted to God. Because if, if they were truly submitted to God, they would be different than they are. And if I'm truly submitted to God, then I will be different than I would be otherwise. In Titus chapter 2, the Bible says, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. When? In this present world. God's saying the grace of God teaches us that we can live godly and soberly and righteously in this present world. But in order to do so, we need to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. What's that word deny mean? Resist. Resist. If we're going to finish the fight and finish the race while keeping the faith, it will require us to submit to God. And it will require us to, to resist the devil. And there are areas and places and times and situations and circumstances every day, every day, that we should practice some resistance. But we don't. Why wouldn't we resist? Because we're not submitted. If once you really submit to God, now you want to resist. But if you're not submitted to God, you're running the show, you, you don't want to resist. Your flesh doesn't want to resist. Your, your nature doesn't want to resist. It wants to conform. Your, listen, your sinful nature wants to go right back where it was. Your sinful flesh wants to do just what it used to do before you got saved. And the only reason you're not is because of the power of God in you and the level of submission that you are giving to God. You think you're oh, I'm a wonderful Christian. I don't do this. I don't do that. I don't go here. I don't go there. Boy, oh boy, oh boy. You think that's you? You know what you is? You is, I want to do that. I want to see that. I want to touch that. I want to smoke that. I want to drink that. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's you. That's your flesh, your, your natural nature. But the reason you don't is Christ in you. Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. He knew that. So if we're not resisting, it's because we don't want to. And if we don't want to, it's because we're not submitted. And you know why we're not submitted? Because we don't want to. We don't want to submit because we don't want to resist. But if we're going to be victorious, we have to submit ourselves to God and get the power, the power to resist. And my last one, we find in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13. So we're told, we're, if we're going to be victorious in the 21st century, if we're going to end up being able to say, I fought a good fight, I finished my course, I've kept the faith, at the end of our life, not now, I'm talking about the end of our life, then we're going to have to submit ourselves to God. We're going to have to resist the devil. Number three, we have to stand. Look at Ephesians 6.13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to what? Stand. stand. 
God's just saying, stand. When we submit to God, he gives us the power to resist. And he gives us an armor of protection to stand. The armor is given to enable us to take on the assaults of the enemy and still stand. The armor is given to protect us from the onslaught of the enemy and still stand. If, we don't have, if we're standing in our own strength and our own power without the armor, we are a pushover, a literal pushover to the enemy, to Satan. So God says, you know what? Submit yourself to, to me. I'll give you the power to resist. And then I'll give you an armor. I'll put an armor around you so you can stand. But if we don't submit to God, we're this all by ourselves. Look at, look at verse 13. See that word withstand? Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to what? Withstand. That word withstand, you know what it means? If you look it up, you know what it, it means resist. It, it's like a picture of um, a palm tree in a in a in a hurricane and the wind's just a blowing everything past it I mean houses are flying by you know and cars are flying and boats are flying by and there's that little palm tree just going I mean it's hairs blowing way back here and what's it doing it's withstanding the gale it's withstanding the force it's standing the house is gone the cars are gone the boats are gone but that little old tree he said, that's what I want you to do. But you can't do that if you don't have the armor on. You see, God made those trees to be able to withstand that. They're, you know, they're specifically created for that place and for those dangers. You understand that, right? Take an old oak tree down there, that thing's snapping in half. The mighty oak. Hurricane. <laughs> right? But you know what? That little palm tree... Look at verse 13. That you may be what? Able. See? God says, he says, you know what? With my armor on, you're able. With my armor on, you're not able. You are able. You understand that, Christian? You are able. If you have the armor on. And look at verse 13. It says the evil day. That word evil day is the Greek word poneros. Now listen to this. It means the hurtful day. It means the vicious day. It means the day of mischief. It means the calamitous day. It means the degenerate day. Have you ever met any of those days? Yeah. Uh-huh. The hurtful day, huh? All, th those are the evil days. And God says there's evil days are coming. Paul said perilous times are coming. Paul said the time will come. God said there's evil days coming. And when the evil days come, be, you should be found submitted to God with the power to resist and the armor of protection. Because if you're not, you're going to be the car flying by. You're going to be the boat flying by. You're going to be the house flying by. And there are a lot of them flying by right now. Right now, A lot of Christians have flown by. And if you haven't met one of those days, you will. But God has provided what you need in order to face them and go through them and come out all while standing. Isn't that incredible? God's saying, you know what, when that evil day comes... And you, you're, you've got the armor of God on. When it's over, you'll still be standing. When that hurtful day, when that calamitous day, when it comes into your life, you got the armor on, you know what? You're resisting and you're submitted. That day will come and go and you'll still be standing. See, it's when those days come to our lives and we don't get blown away. We're found standing. When, it's not going to last forever, no matter how bad it is. And when it's gone, we're supposed to be standing. When, it's gone, when, it, when that evil day is gone, we're not supposed to be working our way back. 
are supposed to be standing right where we were. How? By the power of God. Look what it says in verse 10. Finally, uh, Ephesians 6.10. Finally, my brethren, be strong what? In the Lord and in the power of His might. You don't have to overcome, be overcome by such days. You don't have to be bowled over. You don't have to be bulldozed under. You don't have to be knocked down. Because God is your strong tower and your rock of defense. When we submit ourselves to God, He gives us the power to resist and the protection to stand. It's when we get out from under His wings and stop leaning on the everlasting arms that we find ourselves weak, ineffective, and defeated. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Amen. It's not just a nice little verse. It's not just something to quote. It's something to live. Amen. To be strengthened. And when does he strengthen you? When you submit yourself to him. And when you're standing in the armor. Amen. You know, you can try to be a good Christian, but you'll fail. When you're submitted to God, you don't have to try to be a good Christian. You will be a good Christian. When you're submitted to God and filled with the Spirit, you don't have to try to bring forth fruit. You will bring forth fruit. When you have on the armor and you won't have to try to stand, you will stand. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Submit yourselves, therefore, unto God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Perhaps you're here tonight as a Christian. I want to ask you, are you truly submitted to God? How do you know? When was the last time you purposely and voluntarily and verbally submitted yourself to him? If you're you're having trouble resisting, then you need to be working on submitting. If you're having trouble standing, then you need to work on submitting. And if you really don't care, then you need to get right with God or you need to get saved, one of the two. Maybe tonight you just need to get right with God and you need to start caring. Maybe tonight you need to submit yourself more fully or once again or start submitting yourself regularly to God. Maybe tonight you need to resist. You know there's something you need to resist and you need to get God's power to do it. Maybe tonight you're here and you're not saved, you're watching, you're listening and you're not saved. This power, this armor, this protection is only available to those who are the children of God. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. As many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, it's the grace of God Paul was talking about that enabled him to do and be. But it's also the grace of God that enables you to be saved. For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, the problem is... People think they can save themselves or get saved somehow by doing something. And God says, no, it's by my grace, undeserved favor. And some Christians think they can live the Christian life by doing this and doing that and rolling up their sleeves. God says, no, it's by the grace that I give so freely. It's the only way to be saved is by grace through faith. And it's the only way to be victorious is by that same grace through faith. Father, we thank you tonight. Father, we are human beings. We're sinners saved by grace. We slip and slide. Even even David said he slipped. His feet were almost gone. Father, we know that without you we can do nothing. And so I pray, my Lord, tonight you'd help us to Remember that we need to submit and not just have it somewhere back in the way back of our mind, but to actually have it in the forefront and to actually do it. 
And then we'll have the power to resist and the protection to stand. If we're trying to stand and resist and we haven't submitted ourselves, help us see that. And help us to keep our ongoing submission so we can have an ongoing power and an ongoing protection. Father, I pray for anyone in this room makes the decision and I give them grace. Anyone that needs to be saved, that they might come and meet me at the front, that we can help them. Anyone that's watching or listening, that they might trust the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior before it's eternally too late. We certainly give you all the praise and glory and ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're going to sing number 118. Number 118, please. And as we sing 118, perhaps you'd just like to come and say, Lord, I just saw something there that really was really is going to help me. Help me implement it. Maybe there's something you need to do. Maybe there's some submission needs to be done. Maybe there's something that you need to specifically resist and you've been having difficulty with it. And now you realize that's because I'm trying to do it. And I haven't submitted myself to the power of God. I keep rolling up my sleeves and saying, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. But you haven't submitted yourself to God. I'm not saying there won't be a struggle, but you'll have power. Maybe the devil's not leaving you and he keeps bringing that same temptation because he knows you're not submitted to God or he'd be fleeing. Whatever it is, you come. Talk to the Lord about it as we sing. 118. If you have questions about salvation, come and see me on the first. What a child is this who made to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping. O angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch our keeping this this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing this this is Christ the King the babe the son of Mary. So bring him in such gold and myrrh, come peasant king to own him. The king of king salvation bring. Let loving hearts enthrone him. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. This, this is Christ the King, in the babe, the son of Mary. Mark, will you close us in prayer? Submission, Father God, that's the beginning. Lord, help us to submit to you that we can uh, resist the devil and then stand for what the cause is, and we know what the cause is. That's salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us to take this message to a lost and dying world. People's hearts are a little softer this time of year, Father God. And uh, Lord, it's, sometimes it's a little bit easier to get that message of uh, the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Be with us now, Lord, as uh, we uh, head out tonight, Lord, for the caroling and then the work that has to be done here, Father God. And we'll praise you and thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, here's what we're going to do. Those of you that are not going caroling, if you could stay and